Welcome again, Sean Castleberry to my Philosophical Lecture Shorts. And today we're going to talk about one of my favorite philosophers, that's the Scottish philosopher David Hume. Uh, he was from 1711, was born in 1711, and died in 1776. Now, a lot of stuff we could talk about, but just to be quick, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about his idea, um, or at least reason's role in morality, which we will see doesn't have a very big role at all, okay, which will be kind of totally against Western philosophy up to at least this point, how morality was always thought about. Okay, um, we'll see he says reason is inert, which inert, like an inert force, is a force which doesn't do anything. Okay, now basically look all the way from back to Plato t to this point in time, um, morality was thought of this, if you were to do something wrong, it was seen as irrational, and if you were to do something right or good, it was seen as something that was rational. Now what David Hume wants to show is that rightness and wrongness has nothing to do with reason at all. Okay, so for example, if I was to murder someone, someone like Plato may say I'm being irrational. But what Hume would say is say, that has nothing to do with reason. Now what is he talking about? Well, let's take a look. So he says reason is inert, and what he means is this, is reason, okay, cannot be a motivator there for action, okay? And he means that seriously. So. What does he mean by that? Um, well, here's a really good example. For, uh, take this. Um, so let's say two weeks ago, I borrowed $20 from my friend. Okay? Uh, a week later, I gave him back uh, 10 bucks, okay, $10 back. Now, this is another week later now, and I still haven't paid him that $10 back. All right? So reason, he would say, he can tell me that since I paid him 20 or he had paid me 20 and that I paid 10 back last week, reason says, well, I still owe him 10 But what reason cannot do is motivate me to pay it. All reason tells me is how much I owe. Well, what motivates me to pay? Well, what Hume says actually motivates is not reason, but our passions, or we may use the word emotions. Okay? Passions okay, can only motivate actions. Motivate actions. And he means that. Okay, literally, passions can only make motivate my actions. For example, uh, why do I feel like I have to pay that $10 back is because I feel a feeling or a passion of guilt, perhaps, or uh, I feel like um, I, I like when my friend likes me and I know he'll hate if I don't pay him back, okay? He won't be my friend anymore, which will make me feel bad, okay? The, what causes me to act is not reason, but my passions, okay? Now, reason, as we'll see, uh, we'll put it in a different way here in a little bit, reason, as we'll see, may tell us, you know, uh, if you do this, then this will happen. But reason cannot tell us that it ought to happen, or I ought to do that, okay? Reason can tell us this, this, and this, describe what's going on, but it can't tell me what I ought to do or how I ought to act. What does that, what pushes me and motivates me seems to be my passions, okay? And let me give you kind of a, a really good example that Hume would use all the time. I, it's one of my favorite quotes. He says, tis not, okay, contrary to reason, to prefer scratching my finger to the destruction of the world. So what he basically means here by this, and I may have switched around, I think I got it exactly right, I'm doing it from memory here, but uh, you'll get the idea here. Uh, Tis not contrary to reason, prefer the scratching of my finger to the destruction of the world. Okay, or um, what he means by this is, someone may say this, is like, hey, all you have to do is scratch your finger and the world will be saved. If you don't scratch your finger, the world will be destroyed. So someone may say, well, it would be irrational not to scratch my finger because if I don't do it, the world's going to blow up. But what Hume wants to say is it has nothing at all to do with reason about whether uh, the world should blow up or I scratch my finger. Okay? Reason just tells me this. If I scratch my finger, the world will be saved. If I don't scratch my finger, the world will blow up. It doesn't tell me who, what I should prefer, okay? what I ought to do. What tells me that or what tells me uh, should I prefer it or not is a passion. Do I care about the world in the first place? If I don't care about the world, then it's totally rational to not scratch my finger and let the world blow up. Okay? You see what his point here is? Um, it's our passions that motivate us to want to do something or not to do something, and that's the only thing that can cause our actions. All right? This is kind of a controversial quote, but I think we might get his point here. Um, 
Now, another way we could put it is, this is how he puts it later, uh, what we call the is ought gap, okay? So this is another way to say basically the same thing. The is ought gap, or as G. E. Moore later called it, um, and is famously known as a naturalistic fallacy, okay? A naturalistic fallacy, the is ought gap. He says reason, okay, can tell us what is the case but cannot tell us what ought you know, what ought to be the case okay let me show you what I mean here is uh, I'll use two examples actually well the first one will be a really simple one reason can tell us this uh, let's say I took a gun out and I killed somebody, okay? Reason might be able to describe to us or state the facts about at this certain time, I pulled a gun out, I pulled the trigger at this certain time, uh, this size bullet came out of the gun, it, it entered this person at this point, it exited them at this point, the person lived this long, then died, five minutes later the police showed up and arrested me. Reason can tell us that, but what reason cannot tell us is whether that was right or wrong, whether I ought to do that or ought not to do that. What Hume says tells us what ought it could be as our passions. How do we feel about that? All right, We feel it's wrong because maybe um, when I shot this person, his brother gets upset and has a feeling of pain about it. Then he doesn't want his brother to die. It has nothing to do with reason. It has all to do with how we feel about a situation. Reason can only describe, whereas our passions tend to tell us what ought to be the case, or at least that's how we create morality, as we'll see in a second. All right, So you cannot, or another way to put it, you cannot derive an ought from an is, okay? Cannot derive an ought, okay, from an is. Basically, it means that just because something is the case never, ever, ever, ever means that it ought to be the case. And at least if I can't give you this other example, I'll help you out. I'll use one about me. Okay, so here's me, Sean, all right? Here I am. Happy, happy Sean, in the state I am. Okay, now, sometimes, depending on my mood, or maybe I'm feeling a little sad these days, or something like that, uh, I might want to go eat a lot of food, or something like this. Okay, let's take, for example, one of my um, really bad habits is occasion, on very rare occasions, I like to go to Sonic. Okay, Sonic has all types of things, and you go there, you can't help, but uh, you know, you try to go for one thing, you end up buying like 10 things. Okay, let's say I decide to eat Sonic every day for a year. Sonic every day, all right, for a year. Now, reason can tell us this, that me, Sean, right now, if I were to go and eat Sonic every day, reason would tell us I would become something like this, okay? Really unhappy, fat Sean. Okay, let me draw, got my little arms and legs. I can't even play the guitar anymore because I'm too big. I uh, can't even hold it, okay? Reason will tell me this plus this would turn out to be a very big shock. Now, the question, the next question was asked, does that mean just because reason shows if I do this and this together, that I'll become fat, does reason tell us that I ought not to eat Sonic every day then? And what Hume wants to show us is no. All reason has shown is the facts. If I do this, if I do, or if I do this, this will happen. Reason doesn't tell me I should do that or shouldn't. What tells me whether I should or shouldn't is my passion. Do I care about being fat? Does it make me feel bad if I were to become fat? If I don't give two cents about it, then go ahead, eat Sonic every day. It's up to you, it's your passion. If I really don't wanna be fat and don't wanna be big and it's gonna make me upset, then don't do it. But reason can't tell me that. What motivates me is my passions. And typically my passions usually tell me I don't wanna be in this state. I would feel you know, very depressed, so I try to avoid it. But reason can help me. It's kind of like, reason's kind of like a tool but what we'll see is passions control it. And so what really goes against something like Plato, where he thinks reason can kind of control the passions, what Hume seems to be saying are the passions control reasons. Okay, so I use my reasoning in order to fulfill my passions. Okay, let's say, um, here's just an example on the other side. I'm hungry, I have a feeling of hunger. What reason can help me? I can, my hunger can enlist it in kind of sort of way to say, okay, uh, I need to get in my car, drive down to the store and buy some food. Reason tells me that is how I can fill my hunger, but hunger is what's guided me. 
So Hume is in some way right when he says this, that reason is and ought to be a slave to the passions. Okay? Well, that your reason is a slave to the passions, not the other way around. He has taken Plato and Western philosophy and almost turned it upside down. Okay? Reason is and ought to be a slave to the passions. Okay, now, to try to make this uh, a little clearer, I want to kind of put a counter argument up here that one of my professors uh, from James Madison, when I went there, um, Professor Cohen, I can't remember his first name, I want to say Andrew, but I cannot remember. I'll give him credit though. Professor Cohen had a counter argument against this, and I was sitting in his class with him and argued quite a bit about this because I was a fan of Hume, and I think I agree with him. Um, but Professor Cohen kept getting mad at me, and he kept bringing this example up that I thought he was wrong. And he told me this. He says, well, one day when you have a class of your own, you can put this example up there and show why I'm wrong. But right now, you don't. Okay? Very snooty like that. Um, probably thinking I never would have a class. But guess what? Now I have a class. So now I'm going to show him why he's wrong. Okay? A little personal vendetta here. All right. So let me kind of draw his scene. So let's, for example, take a tree. All right? So we have a tree here. Okay? Now, this particular tree, if we grow it in regular topsoil, and this will be the topsoil here, okay, the tree will grow nice and big. But if we were to grow that same tree in, let's say, a very poor, rocky soil, okay, the same tree may grow for a bit, will then wither over and die, grow very poorly, and rot, and eventually die. Okay? So he's saying this tree grows better all right, in topsoil over in rocky soil. Then can he make the case? That is the case. Can he then go on to say, the tree therefore ought to grow in topsoil like it should? Well, forever he, I mean, I think he believes this works. Forever I always argue against him. And I think if we take what Hume is saying, we can see very easily why, even though the tree by fact does grow better in topsoil, doesn't mean it ought to grow in topsoil, okay? What I want to show is, well, what happens, um, you know, why, why do we prefer, let's think of it, why do we prefer nice looking trees? Well, because they are pleasant to us, all right? Well, the reason I think it ought to grow on top soil is because I like nice big trees outside. I have a passion for big, large trees, so I assume that's the way they should go. Now, what happens if I want to make a uh, monster movie or a horror movie, and I need to make a dilapidated forest with a lot of rotting trees falling over in order to chase my main character through it? Then how I ought to grow the tree? Well, it seems I ought to grow the tree in something like rocky soil because that is what I'm looking for. So what I'm trying to point out, it's still our passions that direct it. That's my passion that tells me I want trees like this, and that's another passion that may say I want trees like this. That just because it is the case doesn't mean it ought to be that way. And I still think this day Professor Cohen's wrong. Okay? I think Hume has a point here about this. Um, just because trees grow better this way doesn't mean they ought to grow that way. Okay? And who, I mean, who are we to basically say that this is how it must grow? Okay? Um, and it, it, at least by a fact of nature. All right? um, now, it makes sense because um, what I call Professor Cohen is kind of like a, um, a, a functionalist, or almost an Aristotelian functionalist, when he believes that each um, being in the world has a particular function, a way that's innate to them that they ought to be, a way it must be. Now, if you assume that, that everything in it has a way it must be, it ought to be, then this might work. But of course, David Hume, and including myself, would maybe deny something like that, that everything has a way it must have to be. Um, and if it did, how could you ever prove that? Okay, and so I still think, here's in my class, I think Professor Cohen, wrong, Cohen is wrong, and I think Hume's point still stands even to something like that. Okay, now, just to be quick, the final point, then what is morality then? If reason has nothing to do with it and reason can't help us, then what is morality? All right, and what we seem to get from Hume is a practical understanding of morality. Morality is practical or pragmatic, okay? Um, it's basically this, he thinks by nature, human beings have sympathy towards those who are close to us. Maybe our mother or father because they uh, brought us up, maybe our brother or sister or those who are, who are friends. We just naturally have empathy, or excuse me, sympathy for those. We have feelings for them. It's just like my brother gets hurt, I feel sad, I wanna help them, okay? That is a natural thing that human beings just have. What morality is, he calls, is extended sympathy, okay? It's an attempt to extend our sympathy okay, to others who are not close to us, to the rest of our society, or as of today, to a global a kind of global idea to everyone else. Morality is, is a kind of 
a practical attempt to take feelings I have for those close to us and make me feel those for others that are outside of us. Now, why ought do we to do that? Why should I feel that way? Well, as we see with human, like I said, it's practical. There's no reason divine in nature that can be shown um, that he could ever show. So he says what we really do is just do it for practical reasons. We do it because it helps us get around in the world. It's useful. Okay? It's much useful to know that my neighbor over here, who I don't really care much about, but to know that he, you know, he's not going to come and kill me because we agreed to this thing that we both don't like that. All right? It's a practical idea. So what do you get when the person who is maybe unsympathetic to anyone goes, I don't care what anyone thinks, I'm going to do what I want, I'll screw everyone over if I can. What do you say to them? Well, the way Hume would have to really look at that would have to be, well, well think about it, sir. You know, if you go doing that, you know, what does that happen to you? What if people are going around screwing you over all the time or screwing your family over time? What would you think? And hopefully that would make him go, well, well, I don't really want that to happen, so I better not do it. Now, if that does not help him, um, there is another option. He says, well, if that doesn't uh, take the case or uh, help you out with it, you can go ahead and keep doing what you want, but there will be consequences. The rest of us don't agree with it, and you'll end up in jail, you'll end up killed, other people will find out and not trust you. What we see is morality for him seems to be practical. It takes sympathy we have for those close to us, attempts to extend it to all others for the practical reason of getting along in the world. And for Hume, that's all morality is. It starts with our passions for those close to us, extends it to all for the help, for the sake of pragmatism, for the sake of practicality. And that is what Hume thinks morality is, or at least all we could ever know of morality. Therefore, that's how we use it. Um, and this is, as I want to point out, this idea of morality uh, basically changes the whole playing field. Up to, to David Hume's point in the history of Western philosophy, reason had a major role. Reason was the key. The reason was the thing that could tame our passions. But Hume flip-flops that and shows that reason can't do that. And it was very interesting, in just a, you know, one small chapter of David Hume's book where he presents this, um, Immanuel Kant, who comes after this, would take an entire book in order to just to try to hopefully maybe disprove this. And I still don't know if Kant does it. Um, Immanuel Kant says that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumber, um, which basically means he was being dogmatic. He was believing in certain things, kind of asleep, not realizing this point. Hume awakes him, and then, of course, causes Kant to write all his work, um, which is very interesting. What I'm trying to point out is David Hume, the extremely important figure, um, not only in metaphysics, epistemology, but in morality. Um, and this is probably his main point. Okay, so that uh, ends our lecture for now. Um, if you have any questions, please e uh, feel free to email me. Um, and I will see you next time on my Philosophical Lecture Shorts. Thank you very much. Thank you.